Hello, in this video I'm going to show you how I photographed and edited this wide shot of the Cygnus constellation which I did completely untracked with just a standard photography tripod. When I posted this image onto my Instagram I got a lot of requests to break down on how exactly did I pull that off, so here we go, let's get started. So let's start with the conditions and the equipment that I used to make this photo. So I shot this from a location of Portal 4 class uh, sky, which definitely helped with untracked photography. And I also used a astronomic CLS filter, which is like a light pollution filter. Uh, I think it also might have had an impact, but shooting from Portal 4, I think you would be good to go even without this kind of a filter. I was using a 50 millimeter lens, uh, 1.4 50 millimeter Sigma Art lens. So this is the lens that I got right here. And I was shooting this wide open uh, at f1.4 and this kind of a big aperture definitely helps when you're trying to catch a lot of light in a short amount of time if you are not tracking the sky and you need to keep your shutter speed fairly short. So the rule of 500 tells me that with a 50 millimeter lens I need to use at most 10 seconds of exposure time. I usually cut it down by half so I use like 5 seconds in order to get a little bit sharper stars because the rule of 500 is kind of too lenient especially if you want to get great quality images. So I would always recommend to, to use a shorter time than the rule of 500 says that you should use. The ISO turned out to be 3200, I think, and I have taken uh, 100, 100 of lights that I then stacked uh, in, in post-processing. I also took like 100 lights, uh, sorry, 100 flats and 100 biases and a couple of dark frames around 20 or something. We're gonna, we're gonna check it out at the computer in just a second. I was shooting this around May of 2021 and that means that during the evening times when I was doing, uh, when I was shooting this photo, the Cygnus constellation was very close to Zenith, so it's like straight up into the sky, which also helps in order to get, you know, good quality images, low light pollution overall. One thing that is worth mentioning also is that I was using an Astro modified Canon EOS R, the one that I'm shooting on right now, and Astro modification that I have done to my camera is the removal of IR cut filter, so that way my camera picks up a lot of more of light of this emission red nebula and maybe that's why I, I think definitely it's it's one of the reasons why the photo turned out to be that good for such a short relatively integration time overall. So let's jump into the computer. I edited using PixInsight and Photoshop. I started with PixInsight so let's jump in there and let me show you my steps. All right so let's check out uh, let's check out actually the one of the lights that I have captured. As you can see the number of lights is uh, actually 99. I had to discard one of them and number of darks is uh, I think it's like 50 yeah, something like this. I actually had to travel back home quite a lot and I was I was shooting the dogs in the trunk of my car when I was traveling back. So let's open one of the lights so you can get a, get an idea of what we are working with here. So let's open that and pick inside. And there it is. So let's give it an auto stretch. And as you can see, a single light uh, doesn't have a much detail. As you can see, there's a heavy vignette around the corners. Like I mentioned, I was shooting this at f1.4, so obviously there would be a lot of vignetting, but thanks to stacking and using calibration frames, especially um, flats. In this case, I was able to neutralize this kind of a vignetting. So, I was uh, to stack. I was using a script here in PixInsight that's called Weighted Batch Preprocessing, and this is basically an automated process that lets you just you just shove in your biases, darks, flats, and lights, and it takes care of everything. It calibrates those files. It registers them, which means that it does all the the, the star alignment to make sure that everything aligns, and then it does the image integration, and you end up with a single file that you can edit. So let's check out this file. Uh, this is right here, master, and this is the master, uh, sorry, master light, this one. So it also opens up a rejection high from the rejection algorithm. We can close that and this one actually you can take a look at that because this shows you how my frame was moving as I was shooting throughout the sky because I wasn't readjusting the position of my camera on the tripod. I just 
had an intervalometer, 5 seconds, keep shooting, 100 frames, oh, that's it. You could, if you want to have more than 100 and you're, you're afraid that your target might slip away from the frame, you can definitely readjust your framing in the midst of shooting, but I didn't do that. And this white edge basically shows me the areas which are not covered by every single of those 99 exposures. So if I'm going to be cropping, it's a good idea to crop based on this image. But let's take a look at the actual stacked light. So let's again auto stretch. And this is what we get. As you can see, it is way better than what we had here. Even the colors are better. Um, and there is no vignetting virtually. So the first step that I did was to crop it out and in order to crop it based on a different image, you can go to process, all processes, uh, dynamic crop, which is here. And then you can click here, you can do that. You can adjust your sort of um, uh, the area that you want to crop. So let's say this one. And then you want to apply this crop, not to this image, but to the light image. So you just drag this triangle onto this and it crops according to the crop rectangle that you have defined. So this is what I did here. Um, yeah, we can cancel that. And also I run an automatic background extraction. This is a very simple tool, um, automatic background extractor. And you don't need to set up your control points to, to indicate where the background is, like with dynamic background extraction. The dynamic background extraction is supposedly better but I'm using the automatic background extractor fairly often and it usually gives me good results. So just play around with the correction, either subtraction or division, whichever works best. And I kind of, you know, try both and see which one I like best. So after doing the automatic background extraction and also I did um, color calibration, which is right here and also noise reduction SCNR, these are again, I just leave uh, all of the settings of these two, the color calibration and SCNR for this case at the default. So just drag them over to the image, let them do their thing and, and that's it. And after doing these steps, I ended up with an image that looks like this. So this is my, uh, this is my cropped image with automatic background extractor, color calibration, calibration, sorry, and um, SCNR. I'm gonna close that. Um, and then the next thing I did is uh, Easy Denoise script. This is a script under here, Easy Processing Suit and Easy Denoise. This is something that you can add as an add-on to PixInsight. It is completely free. You can download that and add it in. I would highly recommend you do that. They have a bunch of neat tools. I will link, um, I will leave a link down below in the description to, to this, uh, this toolkit uh, for PixInsight. So I just run that and it removes noise really nicely and um, kind of a linear unstretched version of the image. So let me open up the version of the image after doing that so you can kind of see what it did. Uh, again, this is still linear. So if I clear the STF, this is what it looks. This is with the screen transfer function. So let's just zoom in somewhere here, um, maybe two to one. And let's do the same for this one. So again, two to one, sorry. Mm. And as you can see, there's a lot of, um, especially in the dark areas around here, around North America, you can see there is a lot more noise in this dark areas than it is here after the denoise uh, routine. And the highlights and detail, I think, didn't suffer too much. And I overall, just I just use it for most of my images. I can highly recommend the, the easy denoise. So after doing that, I just stretched the image and in order to stretch it, I didn't do anything fancy really. I just have taken what the auto stretch is doing and kind of apply it as a histogram transformation. So if you don't know how to do that, um, you can go to processes and there is the screen transfer function. This is how it currently looks for this image. Let's make sure that it actually is. Uh, and then you can go to process intensity transformation and histogram transformation. You can select your view, which is um, this one. And then you can sort of drag it over here. And then you can apply that. So uh, I'm going to apply that here just to show you what is going on. Currently we have uh, both this transformation and also from the SDF. So let me clear the SDF by clicking here. And this is our stretch image, which looks exactly like what the auto stretch would do. And then from this step on, I would just use um, Starnet in order to separate the stars from the nebulosity. So I would go to process mask generation and then Starnet. 
and create star mask in order to uh, end up with two images, one that is starless and another one that is uh, stars only, and then just drag it over. I'm not going to do it now, it takes a bit of time, so I'm just going to show you the results. So let me close that. Actually, I can uh, keep that for reference. So let me open the stretched and the stars. So these are the two images that uh, Starnet spit out to me. Okay, so let's check out these images. So I have the... Uh, Sorry, I opened the wrong file. Um, I need the starless and stars. So this, these two. So this is our, uh, this is the layer, sort of the image with stars only, and this is the starless image. As you can see, it really starts to the nebulosity really starts to show up. We have North America here. We have Pelican. We have the Seder region. We have the Cygnus Loop, and also we have the Elephant's Trunk and Cepheus, and that kind of a region. So. At this point, I just added a gentle curves adjustment. So again, uh, process, intensity, and uh, curves. So where is my curves? It is right here. And then you can go to um, preview. And you can sort of play around, make an S-curve, and kind of bring in some contrast. You can go to a saturation curve. You can bring a bit of saturation. And, and just commit to that. You can do it iteratively as well. Let me just show you what I did at this stage. Um, this is very... Um, very very gentle if we compare the two. I didn't do too much because I prefer to do this step in Photoshop. So again, this is the after curves and this is the before. And then I exported this image after the curves adjustment and the stars as TIFF files, 16-bit TIFF, in order to open them in Photoshop. So let's just go to Photoshop straight away and let me show you the final steps of this edit. So this is what we have in Photoshop. As you can see, currently you only see the starless version. I have the stars uh, on a fourth layer right here, which I'm going to introduce a little bit later on. So for now, what I did is I um, basically duplicated this layer and opened a camera raw filter uh, and adjusted color noise and clarity. If we zoom in here and some of the darker areas, maybe here, you can definitely see a difference. This is without the color noise reduction and this is with the color noise reduction. It really smooths out a lot of these color artifacts here if you're using a DSLR or a mirrorless camera. So I did that and also added a, a bit of, of clarity to kind of bring it, bring out the, the nebular areas, make them pop a little bit more. And again, to do that, filter and Adobe Camera Raw, which opens like a, like a UI that is similar to what you have in Lightroom. Then I added a bit of an S-curve right here with the curves, as you can see, a very gentle, honestly, very gentle S-curve, uh, nothing, nothing extreme, so let me just enable that. As you can see, this is the after, this is the before, to again make those, those nebula pop a little bit more. And then I introduced my stars, so I have the stars layer right here. In order to make them blend in with the starless version, you need to change the blending mode from normal to linear dodge add. Uh, or screen, I think as well, but I'm just using this linear dodge. And then I added, um, this is called a vignette, but it's not, not really a vignette, but like darkening of these kind of areas, this corner here and this corner here, because we have the Milky Way going sort of diagonally. So this is just like a like a curve that goes below to, to, to darken the image, and it is only applied to these corners with this kind of a layer mask. The reason why it's called Vignette is because I was using a Lumenzia uh, plugin for that, which automatically names this layer Vignette, but it's it's not important. And then I added a bit of sharpening using an unsharp mask, so, um, unsharp mask, so I just stamped everything to get the layer an image layer with everything that I have done so far. And this is that, and I added a bit of sharpening using filter, sharpen and unsharp mask. So uh, this kind of sharpens up the image a little bit. It is subtle, but you can, you, we can kind of pixel peep. This is the before, this is the after. And then as a final step, I added yet another curve uh, with this, as you can see, a very, very gentle curve. Usually the way I apply curves in this situation is by using a hand tool. So uh, I can disable that and let's add another curves. Uh, and then with this fresh curve, I will just use a hand tool here and kind of pick a bright region, bring it up a little bit, pick a dark region, bring it down a little bit, look at it overall, whether I like it or not. And that's basically how I would apply curves here. Let's just enable the one that I used in my original edit. And this is pretty much, this is pretty much everything that I did here in, uh, in editing. 
So that is basically it. As you can see, the editing process is not really that complicated. It's basically a bunch of contrast adjustments and, and, and that kind of stuff. So honestly, if you have uh, if you have an object that is in Zenith, if you're living or are willing to travel to a Bortle 4 location and you are in a possession of a fast lens, it doesn't need to be an expensive Sigma Art lens. It could be a Nifty 50 that opens up to 1.8. It would really give you a similar result. So. Go ahead, try that, and the key is to shoot as much uh, those as much lights, those those light exposures, the exposure of the actual object, as possible. Stack them together and then just try to edit them, and you might be surprised what kind of an awesome photo you can end up without using any kind of star tracker. So that's basically it for me for today. If you like this video, please make sure to give it a like. I would really appreciate it. Also consider subscribing to my channel. I'll be posting a lot more astrophotography-related content. I already have a bunch of content on my channel, so you can check that out. See if it anything is interesting to you and hopefully see you in one of my next videos. Clear skies and bye bye.